Well, the recent synod on the family and all the controversy around it has often put me in mind of um, the greatest Catholic churchman of the 19th century, namely John Henry Cardinal Newman, who's kind of a hero of mine. Uh, Newman was a genius and wrote uh, beautifully on a whole variety of topics, from university education to the nature of the papacy to ecclesiology, lots of other things. But I'm especially put in mind of his great work on the development of doctrine. So Newman's great masterpiece called um, On the Development of Christian Doctrine comes out at the time when Hegel and uh, Darwin were sort of in the ascendancy. What I mean is this focus on what they called Lebensphilosophie, a philosophy of life, a sense of how things evolve and change over time. So in line with that idea, Newman proposes that Christian doctrine, precisely because it's a living thing, is not simply given once and for all but rather unfolds and develops, becoming more fully itself only over time. Now, the organic examples come right to mind. The way a plant or a tree unfolds. So in a certain way, the oak tree is there implicitly in the, in the you know, acorn, but then it has to evolve through time and space. Or think of a river, a favorite image of Newman's, a river that is very unimpressive at the beginning, at its, at its uh, uh, source, but then over space and time, you know, as it broadens and deepens, the river becomes extremely rich. Think of the difference between the source of the Mississippi and the mouth of the Mississippi in New Orleans. Um, so living things unfold in a similar way. So, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity. Is it true that it was simply given by Christ to his apostles who then received it and passed it on like a football uh, over the centuries? Well, clearly not. It's implicit in the New Testament, for sure. There's all kinds of texts you can point to. Most notably, that God is love. There must be a lover, beloved, and, and love. Also, baptize everyone in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are lots of implicit references to it. But it took a long time to get from the biblical roots of the Trinity to, let's say, St. Augustine's great De Trinitate, with its beautifully developed uh, analogies, or to get to the 13th century, and Thomas Aquinas' magnificent treatise on the Trinity in the first part of the Summa Theologiae. Did Augustine and Aquinas understand the Trinity more fully than, let's say, St. Peter? Yeah, sure, Newman would say. What's implicitly given to St. Peter and the first Christians, now developing over time and coming to richer and richer expression. Moreover, are we now in a position beyond Augustine and Aquinas that we see with even greater clarity because the rivers continue to, uh, to move on? Sure. Ideas are living things. One of his famous observations is that a real idea is equivalent to the sum total of its possible aspects. Now think about this. If you're, you see somebody and he presents a certain profile, a certain you know, uh, view, light hitting him in a certain way. Now walk around that figure, walk all around him, and you'll see all the various profiles and angles and, and lighting and so on. It's only when you get that full vision do you have an adequate sense of, of the person. Well, that's true of a physical object. A fortiori is it true of things like ideas, an idea like the Trinity. Only when it's tossed up in the air and it catches the light in different ways. Only when one lively mind tosses it to another lively mind, and in their uh, conversation, in the back and forth. Now, at a particular time, yes, now over time. So one generation passes it to another. One century passes it to another. Only in that lively play of minds does the fullness of a real idea emerge. That's Newman's uh, insight. In light of all this, the most famous line from that book, maybe the most famous line in all of Newman, uh, finds its proper context. The line is, in a higher world, it's otherwise. But here below, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. Here below, in this ordinary world, to be alive is to change. And to be perfect as an organism, as an idea, as a river, is to have changed often that you're becoming more fully yourself. Okay, now I realize, hearing this little presentation, people might be getting nervous, as people in Newman's time got nervous. Well, does this mean that doctrine is just up for grabs? That it's constantly changing? 
as one uh, kind of cynical wag put it some years ago, do we put our doctrinal statements in loose leaf binders? We're just going to change them every generation? Well, Newman heard those same critiques back in the mid 19th century. Here's his answer Newman said, no, no, the change I'm talking about is not the undermining of a doctrine, but the doctrine coming fully to itself, changing so as to remain the same, as the cliche has it. He gave us seven criteria to distinguish between a devolution and an evolution. What I mean is a corruption of a doctrine and a legitimate development of a doctrine. And I'll just say a word about three of them. Go to the text to find all seven. Here's the first criterion, what he calls preservation of type. So here's an original idea. Here's a, here's a proposed development of it. Is the development of the same fundamental type as the original? Is its essential structure the same? Are its principles intact? Now, Newman observes, this doesn't mean that, that B looks just like A. So he says famously, the butterfly is the development, but by no means the image of the caterpillar. That's a good idea. The caterpillar and butterfly, one looks almost nothing like the other, yet the butterfly is a development of the caterpillar. Turn it around. So the Roman Empire was a corruption of the Roman Republic, though in its institutional structures and exterior forms looked pretty much the same. The, the Rome of Caesar Augustus and the Rome of Julius Caesar looked fairly similar on the outside, yet there was a complete corruption of type. So that's our first consideration. Has the type, the principles, the structure been preserved? The second criterion I'll look at is what Newman calls conservative action upon its past. It's pretty straightforward. It means a development is conserving what was there. It's not undermining what came before, it's, it's preserving it. I think here of uh, Cardinal Pell, who during the Synod got up and said, look, the church doesn't do backflips on its doctrine. That's the same idea. Yes, doctrine develops. Think of Vatican II represents a remarkable development of, of doctrine in many different uh, uh, arenas, especially ecclesiology, theological anthropology, etc. Et development, but never a backflip. You're always conserving what's come before. Here's the third one that I always find really interesting. A properly developing idea has what Newman calls the power of assimilation. It's again the analogy of a living thing. Think of a, a living organism, animal, which is able to assimilate from its environment what it needs to. It can eat, drink, and take in, even as it resists what it has to. So an animal that has no resistance to the environment is called a dead animal. It means the environment has just taken over the animal. An animal that has no power to assimilate the environment is also a dead animal, right? It's that subtle play between uh, taking in and holding off that allows something to live. So, Newman says, a living idea has this power. It's very interesting because he cuts both directions. If you say, oh, here's a new proposal and it's just like what everyone is saying out there in the wider world. That's probably a corruption, because it doesn't have the power of assimilation, rather it's been assimilated. Or here's an idea that's so peculiar, <laughs> so distinctive and unique, that nobody can relate to it. That's probably a corruption. A complete, complete resistance of the culture and complete acquiescence of the culture are probably signs of a, a corruption. So what are we looking at? Is, is this power, is this new idea a living idea? That's the third criteria. Okay, there are four more. Take a look at the text for all seven. But what I'd recommend now to everybody who's, who's concerned about the Synod is take a deep breath, take a step back, and maybe look at the synodal uh, deliberations so far. We're, we're nowhere near the end of it, as I've said before. But look at what's come so far and apply Newman's criteria. I think it'll allow us to get beyond the sort of um, immediate emotional reaction stage. There are people who are immediately reactive to the Synod, they're immediately enthusiastic about it. Maybe we all step back. Take a look at it with these objective criteria, and I think we'll make some more progress.